This video covers chapter 11, problem, specifically problem ST-2 on page 395 of your textbook. It's a capital budgeting problem and it, um, it covers the, the main topics of the chapter. And it asks us uh, to compute the net present value, internal rate of return, modified internal rate of return, payback and discounted payback periods for two projects, project X and project Y. And here's the cash flows laid out. Uh, that's shown in the text. Now, let's look. Before you do a problem like this, you always want to glance at these cash flows to see what's going on. Uh, first off, you see they're normal cash flows. There's only one change of sign in each one. So it flips from negative to positive one to positive here. Here it's negative, and it flips to positive. Just pretty normal. This one, in fact, cash flow looks almost like a bond. You know, you pay $10 for the bond, it pays off 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, and 3.5, basically, on the note. Um, the other thing you notice, so so that, that makes it easier. So the, there's only one change in sign, which is going to tell you that there's only one internal rate of return. Um, that's nice. Um, there's the same scale. These two, these two projects have the same scale of 10. So that's another thing that, that's nice. They're comparable in that respect. Uh, easily, more easily comparable. Okay, so let's get right down to it. Let's start calculating the NPVs. And because that's the first question is, what is the NPVs? So net present value of project X. Let's do it. So you're going to have to get your financial calculator out. And I'm going to do it here on the side while I'm talking to you. And we're going to hit uh, the CF button to get in the cash flow mode. And when we do that, we're going to see CF0, and we're going to make CF0 minus 10. I'm going to chop off all of the zero, you know, not all of them, just three of the zeros. So put everything's in thousands. Um, you, you don't have to do that. You can do it. Um, you can put all the zeros in if it makes you comfortable, makes you feel better. Um, okay, so then we're going to hit enter. So we put minus 10 and then a negative sign in there, and then enter, down arrow, and we're going to have... Um, pop up CO1, which is cash flow for period one, and we're going to put 6.5 in there, right? The first cash flow from this. <clears throat> and we're going to hit enter and then down. And what's going to happen is it's going to show FO1. Remember that FO1? That's the frequency of the cash flow in period one. In this course, it's always one for all the Fs in this cash flow mode. It's always one, so we're just going to leave it there. And the way we leave it there is we just skip by it by hitting the down arrow. So we're going to skip right by that. And then we come to CO2, and we're going to put in 3. For CO2, we'll hit Enter and hit the down arrow, and then you'll come to FO2. You know, again, frequency means how many in period 2, how many cash flows, how many, how frequently do you have this $3 cash flow in period two? You only have it once, so that's what that means. So leave it at one by just skipping over it. Then CO3 is going to be um, three, enter, down arrow. Uh, FO3 is going to be one, so just skip it. CO4 is going to be one. The last cash flow here. Last cash flow is one. And we're going to hit enter and then down arrow. And then FO4 is going to be one. And we're going to leave it there. And what you want to do is you want to go down to CO5 and CO6, CO7. Just hit your down arrows a bunch of times. Make sure that they're all zero. These, in other words, this project only goes out four periods, four years. And these cash flows, technically, that aren't here, they're zero. So you want to make sure they're zero and you don't have some leftover problem from a homework assignment that's in your calculator and, and you're picking it up in this problem. You want to make sure you don't have that problem. So make sure those later cash flows are zero. Okay, when you do that, let me get this to the situation here. You're going to hit NPV now. When you hit MPV, out will pop an I, and that's the interest rate. And according to the problem, oops, according to the problem, the interest rate is 12%. That's the weighted average cost of capital. 
And so what, what they're basically implying in the problem is that pro projects X and Y are of average risk. So that's the discount rate that's appropriate in the setting. Okay, so we hit I slash Y, and we hit an enter, enter, and then down arrow, and we and out will display, NPV will display on your screen, and you need to hit compute now. And it'll take a second to, to do some calculations, and that will pop point nine six six, which um, is nine hundred and sixty six dollars if you don't chop the three zeros off. So it's point nine six of a thousand, ninety six percent of a thousand, or nine hundred and sixty six dollars. That is the NPV of X. Now I'm going to hold off on interpreting this because that's part B of the the questions, and I'm still on part A. So I'll be on part A for a while. Um, and then we'll, we'll um, do comparisons and compare and contrast and figure out which is the better project and why uh, when we look at part B. Um, but bef so, so now we have net present value of X. Now normally I would move right to the net present value of Y. I mean that would make sense. But for, uh, to facilitate things, what you, you ought to do and realize is, look, all this cash flow, it's, all st it's already in the registers of your calculator. Take advantage of it. And hit IRR button. Hit the IRR button. Remember, here's my here's my other financial calculator. So I use these cash flow buttons, and I use the net present value button. Now I want to use the IRR button right here. So I hit the IRR button, and I hit compute. And the screen will go blank for a little bit as it searches for that internal rate of return. And I come up with 18.03% for IRRX. So there I got two of the calculations. That third, the second calculation done quite quickly, knowing that I had all that information already in my calculator. Now let's do project Y and PV. And then we'll be able to do IRR pretty quickly. So we're going to do net present value of Y. So we're going to follow the same format. So input the, the um, input the cash flows. So basically, same method. It's still going to be ten thousand dollars. This is uh, for the first cash flow. This is going to be three point five. This will be three point five, three point five, and then three point five. Okay, and so you're going to go right down the same methodology in that calculation. Okay. Let's see here. So then when you do that, <clears throat> your net present value will pop up. You will come up with a net present value of Y of 63072. Okay? Now, you're going to have all that information in your calculator on those cash flows. Why not hit the IRR button and, um, and, and watch and then hit compute. And then that will pop 14.96% IRR for Y. Okay, so there we got um, two calculations done fairly quickly. Um, and now we can go to to um, modified IRR. So I can't rely too much on my financial calculator. I'm still going to use a calculator, but I'm not going to use the financial part as much because I need to calculate modified internal rate of return. The question's asking for it. So we're going to do it. <coughs> um, and by the way, why are we doing modified internal rate of return? Well, we're doing it because... Um, the internal rate of return for this project is, fifth, is nearly 15%. In the other project, it was 18%. Remember, when you do internal rates of return, the internal rate of return assumes that you can reinvest the cash flows at 18% in this case and at 15%. That's kind of high. What if you can't reinvest those cash flows at that rate that that's that high? And the only the only um, 
rate that you can get is about the weighted average cost of capital, 12%. Well, if that's the case, these internal rate of return are a little misleading. You're really not going to earn 18%. You're really not going to earn 15%. You're going to earn something less. How much? Well, that's what this MIRR is going to tell us. So let's do the MIRR for the first project, X. Draw our timeline. Minus 10, 6.5, 3, 3, and 1. So what remember, what we want to do is we want to grow this cash flow. So 6.5 is going to get grown at 1, 2, 3 periods at 12%. That will come up to be 9.132. Let's take this cash flow, grow it at three, at two periods at 12%. That comes out to be 3.763. Um, this cash flow, three, oh, three times 1.12 to the one power. It comes out to be 3.36. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add up these cash flows right here, get the future value, and the future value is 17.255. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to find the interest rate that gets me from $10,000 to $17,000, basically. And so that's the that would be the modified internal rate of return. And so um, what I'm doing is I'm reinvesting these cash flows. Hmm at a nice realistic 12% instead of 18% with the internal rate of returns assuming. So, so basically, e mathematically, it's 1 plus MIRR to the fourth power, because it's four periods between here and here, it's going to equal to 17,255. So what is that internal rate of return that gets me there? This is a basically a present value. This is 1 plus r to the fourth power. This is a future value. So divide both sides by 10. 1 plus mirr to the fourth equals 1.7255. Okay. Now we want to get rid of this exponent, so we take both sides to the 1 fourth power, or in other words to the 0.25 power. So I'll take this to the 0.25 power, which is the 1 fourth power. And when I do that, I get um, this side equals, let's see, 1 1.1461. Or in other words, the MIRR equals 14.61% for Project X. Make sure that's, a, that's an X there. So there we have the modified internal rate of return. Notice it's not as large as the 18% because that 18% assumed we reinvested the cash flow at 18%. We only reinvested it at a more realistic 12%, brought it back down to earth. Okay, so that's really a better measure of our return. Okay, let's do the modified internal rate of return for project Y. Again, timeline. Minus 10, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5. I'm going to grow these guys out. And uh, when we grow these guys out, I'll give you the numbers. You can do the growth at home in your own calculation. This will come out to be 3.92, 4.39, 4 4.917. Okay, the total future value is 16.727. And again, it's 10. Go to grow at the modified internal rate of return for four periods. It'll get me 16.727. Divide both sides by 10. Oops. 1.6727. Take both sides at a one-quarter power. 
and we get um, 1.1373, which means it's 13.73% when I subtract the 1 off it. Okay, subtract the 1, we get 13.73% for the MIRR of Y. So, again, we come down to something much more realistic. Um, we had an internal rate of return of 14.96% uh, on a slide back. On these slides, yeah, here it is. 14.96. Now that's reinvesting the cash flows at 14.96. We reinvested them here at 12%, and I came down to a more realistic rate of return for this project of, of just under 14%. Okay. Now let's let's do the discounted payback and payback. So let's do payback. And uh, let's lay out the cash flows here, Project X. So I'm going to do payback and discounted payback together. It just makes more sense, um, as you'll see in a second. So we're going to have year. We're going to have cash flow. Remember, put this vertically. Normally we do all our cash flows vertically, but... It makes a lot of sense to do everything here um, vertically. Now, th that's our years. This is our cash flow. Now, this is the whole or the cumulative amount. How much we're in the hole by? So, when you start off, you invest in this project, you're in the hole by ten grand. So, you plunk ten thousand dollars to buy Project X. Okay, but then here comes along the first cash flow, six thousand five hundred dollars. So now we're only in the cat in the hole by three point five thousand. So ten minus ten plus six point five gives us the minus three point five. Now we need the next cash flow to offset. We're still in the cat hole. This next cash flow gets us closer to digging ourselves out of the hole. We're still at minus point five. So you add the three, we're still at minus point five. Now look, we're going to be somewhere between year two and three. We're going to dig ourselves out of the hole. And um, so, so when we dig ourselves out of the hole, we know it's going to be it's going to take two years, plus the proportion of time. 0.5 divided by three. What we're assuming is these this three cash flow is coming in to the business, nice and smooth. And how how many years? What fraction of a year is it going to take us to bring only a half in? Well, it's 0.5 divided by three. That proportion. And so that equals 2.167 years. So this, it takes um, 0.167 years to recover this 0.5 cash flow, assuming $3 comes in evenly throughout the year. So this is our payback for Project X. It pays itself back in two years. Now, if we want to do discounted payback, um, we, we should do it right here so we have things lined up. So let me um, let me extend the analysis over here. They do discounted payback. And so, I'm sorry, so discounted payback is what we want to do. And in order to do and implement discounted payback, we need to figure out discounted cash flow. So what we need to do is discount these cash flows here by the 12% weighted average cost of capital. So that's minus 10 because um, you're not discounting it at any time. It's right at time zero. Now we want to discount the 6.5 for one year at 12%. That comes out to be 5.8. Discount the 3 at 12% for two years. 2.39. And then continue. And then 0.6355. Now let's look at the cumulative. Or in other words, how far are we in the hole? But using discounted cash flow. So we're in the hole by 10 again. And we're going to use, instead of 6 digging us out of the hole, we only have 5.8 to dig us out of the hole because we had to discount it. And so remember, the point of discounted cash flow is it makes up for the 
the gigantic problem we have here that we ignored discounting. Yeah. And, you know, it depends on how high the discount rate is to how much of a problem you're going to have. But 12% is fairly high, so in this case, it'll have a big impact. If interest rates were like 3%, yeah, there would be very little difference here. But 12% is pretty significant. So take the 10, minus 10, offset it by the 5.8, and you're still in the hole by 4.2. And then use this 2.39 to offset these guys, the four, negative 4.2. Minus 1.81. Now, ooh, look at this. This next cash flow is bigger than this one, so it means we're going to go pot. We're we're going to dig ourselves out of the hole again, somewhere at two years. Plus, um, we're going to assume that this cash flow comes in evenly. And we only need to cover 1.8. So 1.81 divided by 2.3135 means it's 2.85 years is the payback, discounted, I'm sorry, discounted payback for Project X. So you should, if you did the math right, you should always have a discounted payback that's larger, I mean longer. It takes longer to pay back the discounted payback than, than regular payback because you just shrink all these cash flows that are coming in. You shrank them through discounting. Okay, so there we have that. Now let's figure out the payback and discounted payback for the last project. Y. Okay, payback. Y. Discounted payback. Y. Here. Cash flow, cumulative hole, 10. Remember, everything comes in 3.5 here as an annuity. And so we're in the hole by 10. Offset that 10 by 3.5. We're in the hole by 6.5. And we're in the hole by 3. And wow, look what happens. We. Um, Pay ourselves back, and it's just by coincidence that this keeps happening at two, between two and three. We're going to pay ourselves back at two years plus, assume this 3.5 comes in evenly, and we need to recover three out of the 3.5, and so this is 2.857 years as the payback for Y. 2.87, that's a seven years. The payback line. Okay, well, let's do um, discounted payback. So we've got to discount those cash flows at the 12%. No discounting because there's no time to discount. Now we need to discount this 3.5 at 12% for one year. That's 3.125. Discount this two years at 12%, and so on. Now let's figure out the cumulative hole. Um, okay, so we're in the hole by 10, right? Add the 3.125, and now we're in the hole by 6.875. Offset it by this 2.79. We're still in the hole, still in the hole. Ooh, look at this, finally. That we're paying ourselves back in three years, right? Three, because this is period three. This is zero. You're losing, losing the time periods here. Um, MEC. See, we're paying ourselves back. It's three years plus this ratio. So it's 3 plus 1.594 divided by 2.224. And that comes out to be 3.716 years as discounted payback for Project Y. Okay.
So we just completed part A and did all the calculations with pretty minimal interpretation of it. Now part B asks which projects should be accepted if they are independent, meaning um, we can, if we have the money, we can invest in all of these if they're worthwhile. Okay, so we're not choosing one or the other. We have the ability to look at all of them. And so that's what we want to do in Part B. But before I want to answer Part B, I want to let's let's summarize all of the all of the numbers we just calculated. Okay, so here is the results all summarized, nice and neat for Project X and Y. And so the question is: these projects are independent. Which ones do? Which will we will we accept? Uh, which what will we accept? One or both? Uh, or none. And so remember, when you're independent projects, you can pick all of them or none of them, um, or anything in between, as provided they're acceptable. So um, here, let's look at, um, according to net present value, they're both positive net present values. Now, uh, I moved the decimals over, so this is $966, this is $630. The, it's greater than zero, so both projects are acceptable. They cover all the expenses, including the cost of capital, and adjusted for risk. It includes everything. They're positive, so both of these add the shareholder wealth. So we would accept both of them are acceptable. Um, in terms of internal rate of return, the internal rates of return are greater than the 12% weighted average cost of capital, which means, again, these projects are paying off a return greater then all the expenses, including the cost of capital, which is the 12% from the weighted average cost of capital number. So these are profitable projects. They add the shareholder wealth. It's hard to see how much they add the shareholder wealth just looking at these two numbers. Um, that's where NPV comes in. This is how much it adds the shareholder wealth. But um, you can't really see it here. But um, you can make the decision that these both are acceptable. Now, the modified internal rates of return, again, are also greater than 12%. So these two projects, both of them are acceptable according to this rule. Now, the next two um, rules, the next two methods here, um, let's see. We have payback of over two years in this case. Now, the, one of the flaws with this, the question in the textbook is it doesn't give us, nowhere does it give us a cutoff. Like what is the business, you know, what is this firm's cutoff for a payback? You know, if it's if it's a four-year cutoff, let's say everything has to pay back in four years or less, then all of these projects work. If it's a cutoff of three, then according to payback, it all works. And discounted payback, you'd have to reject Y because Y would not be acceptable if if um, we had a cutoff of three years. Okay. So in the solutions in the back of the book, it doesn't somehow, somehow ignores all that. Um, but you need to consider, take it into consideration. So these, um, if we say four years, and I think that's what the textbook is assuming, all the, these, these two projects are acceptable regardless of the method used because they're paying back fairly quickly. Okay, so that's um, under uh, independence. We'd accept both projects, and we're getting consistent uh, estimates all along here that we should accept both projects provided we have the money. Now, the next question is, um, part C is, what happens if these projects are mutually exclusive? Which ones do we pick? Which one will we pick, I should say? Which one are we going to pick? So mutually exclusive, one or the other. So you pick the one with the highest net present value. Okay, the winner is X. Um, you pick the highest internal rate of return. The winner is X. You pick the highest MIRR. The winner is X. You pick the lowest payback period. The winner is X. The lowest discounted payback. The winner is X. So it's unanimous. X is the project to invest in if you have to pick one or the other. So this would be an example of Look, this, project, this is a conveyor belt system, and this is a forklift lift system. And so you can put either one or the other. So you're going to pick the, um, the conveyor belt system rather than the forklift. So you're going to pick this one. 
Now, the final part of this problem talks about, part D talks about how might a change in a weighted average cost of capital produce a conflict between net present value and internal rate of return rankings of the two projects? Would there be a conflict if the weighted average cost of capital were 5%? Hint, um, use, use net present value profiles, and the crossover rate is 6.22%. Okay, so what it's doing is this. It's asking us, use these profiles. Remember how the profile is calculated here. Let me make sure i got the whole thing here. This is uh, NPV on this axis. <clears throat> And over here is weighted average cost of capital on this axis. So you have a right here, zero NPV, zero weighted average cost of capital right at that point. So let's plot it out. Let's plot X and Y, the profiles, the graphs of these things. Now, um, the net present value when the discount rate is zero, we're on this axis, right? That means we're going to simply add up the cash flows to the problem. Simply add up the cash flows here. So if we add up the 6.5, um, 3, 3, and the 1, offset it with the 10, that's assuming a discount rate is 0. When you have no discount rate, you just add up all the cash flows. The cash flows of x is 3.5 sum. The sum of these cash flows is 4 for y. That gives us this, the points right here. Zero discount rate gives us uh, 4.0 for y and 3.5 for x. Okay, in dollars now because we're at net present value. Okay, so that's where the two points hit. Now we also know. We also know where the where these lines are going to hit and intersect this axis, the x-axis, because that's the internal rates of return. So we know x is going to hit at about 18% and y is going to hit at 15%. So um, let me uh, let me draw the lines in first to see if I can get them in right with a curvature. Okay, let me get a different color in. So this will be y, and y has a 14.96% sigma. So let me back out the, this so we get a little more space in here. Hmm. There we go. There we go, see the whole thing. Okay, so that's Y. Now let me get red pen and put in X. And there's X curve. It's supposed to be a little bit of a bow. Oops. And that's X. And that comes in at 18.03%. At, uh, and so we see they cross. It tells us in the problem that that's at 6.22%. And so... Um, this profile, these two profiles tell you that there's a conflict now. There's a conflict between the two solutions. Weighted average cost of capital, for example, is telling us, or the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return for X is telling us it's the winner. Okay, using internal rate of return, winner. Here, Y is the winner. So this is with a zero discount rate, and this is at the basically, um, at a, at a rate that is discount rate that is very very high and so what we have here is the conflict is the conflicts here here's the conflict here there's agreement they're consistent this is what I mean look X is the winner here but and and so it's the winner all along here. X is the winner in terms of net present value. So remember, everything above this line is is focused on net present value. Only at these two points 
or are we looking at internal rates of return? And so when you have discount rates that are below this cross or that are above this crossover, so you're above this 6.2%, the net present value is the winner for X. X the net present value is highest. And X is internal rate of return is highest. So it's consistent. So I'm saying consistent. Okay. But as soon as you get to the left of this crossover, you find out that X is the loser at this point, at these points. X is the loser, but according to internal rate of return, it's the winner. So there's a conflict between the two solutions here. Okay? And here you see Y is the winner at low rates, and it's the loser at low rate, at high rates. So low rates, Y is the winner. Low rates here, it's the winner. But at higher interest rates, when you're moving in this direction, it is the loser compared to X. Okay? So there's conflicts, and why, why are the conflicts? Well, two, you can look at it from two, two, two angles, basically. Two angles, it has to do with the timing of the cash flows. And this is how you view it. Here, back to our original cash flows. Let's, let's look up here now. When interest rates are really, really low, what's happening is why is the winner why is the winner? Because interest rates are low, these cash flows are dominating. These cash flows that are further out, they're not getting discounted at all. And they're kind of heavier than the cash flows here. In this project, in X, they're kind of small. And so, uh, and they're all bunched up over here at period one. So when discount rates are low, these are getting a lot of weight, okay? Which is why Y is the winner here. But when interest rates are high, interest rates are high, what's happening is these things are getting discounted. The, all these big cash flows, relatively heavy cash flows, which are pushed out this way, are getting discounted at high rates. It's causing Y to be less attractive. You know, you'd rather discount really small numbers like you're discounting here um, when you have high discount rates. So it has to do with the discount rate. The flip side of it is um, as the textbook talks about the this, this same angle, is it all depends on the reinvestment rates that are being done here. When you have internal rates of return of 18%, like we have for X, you get to reinvest this cash flow at 18% for these periods. This period, this period, and this period. So you get to reinvest this giant cash flow for three periods versus this little cash flow for three periods. And so that that causes X to be the winner. You get to reinvest this cash flow for a longer period of time. And so that's basically the, the same thing flipped from a, one angle is from a reinvestment perspective, the other is from a discount perspective. But you come up to the same solution, and you ultimately come up to the same reason as to why you have these crossovers. It has to do with the timing, uh, the relative timing of the cash flows and the amounts.